A reading from Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Word of God, word of life. The Holy Gospel according to St. John. Glory. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus said to the Jewish people who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. But they answered him, We are descendants of Abraham. And have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying, you will be made free? Jesus answered them, very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household, yet the son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. So this is another one of those cool weekends um, when we get to take a cue from the confirmands in our midst who are leading us into God's kingdom. As you might know, uh, this is the weekend when we walk with them, walk with our confirmands as they affirm their baptism through this process that's come to be called confirmation. Um, and, you know, confirmation is a pretty wild undertaking, especially here at Mount Olive. I mean, there's, there's four years of classes, um, plus small group time and time for discernment, and then a, a few summer trips sprinkled here and there. And then there's the culmination the writing of the faith statement. And you should read these faith statements. They're posted out in the hall on these poster boards. They are mag magnificent pieces of narrative theology. Um, and I invite you to respond to them. As you see uh, these youth in our midst, um, talk to them about these stories that they're sharing. And you know, when we sit down to write these faith statements together, uh, we encourage the confirmants to to embrace the narrative in which they find themselves. And then we also encourage them to articulate what that means to be a part of God's people here and now. We ask questions like, where do you understand God to be in your life? Or um, how do we live in response to God's good news for all of humanity and creation? not just questions for confirmands, I think. And just like our confirmands assert that, that God is, is a part of our everyday experiences, like the sports we participate in, or, or the music we share, or our families, or loved ones we spend time with, we're also reminded by our confirmands that God is also with us when times aren't so great. And also that God is, is never through with us, that God continues to walk with us and, and push us and move us and challenge us through all seasons of life. For Jesus is the one then that we see as the one who shows us this way and leads us towards this, this liberating, freeing truth. 
truth that has something to do with our continuing way to to figure out what it means to be God's people and, and learning how to live faithfully in response to God's action, which I think is part of the connection to the day that we celebrate here, Reformation Sunday. I mean, for for the red that drapes our sanctuary today is is the reminder for us of how that fiery Holy Spirit ignited people's lives nearly 500 years ago in Germany as the process of the reformation of the church began. As it gave birth to new ways of understanding, thinking about God's liberation and and new life, how that sprung up unexpectedly amidst this life of of the young monk, Martin Luther. You know, as much as we point to the Reformation 500 years ago as a challenging time for the people of God and a time when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon God's people and was moving dynamically, you know, I think it was really just one more turning point along the road in an ongoing narrative of evolution and change amidst the people of God. I mean, for we, for we as God's people have always been changing. And the Reformation mantra of always reforming or continual reformation makes larger contextual sense throughout the ages because it names a truth that supersedes just one place or time. I mean, centuries before Jesus, even, Jeremiah's words, which we hear today, they revealed a narrative of ongoing change and identity reformation that preceded Martin Luther by nearly two millennia. As Jeremiah says, the days are coming, right? The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the houses of Israel and Judah, and this covenant will be like life-giving law being written upon people's hearts. And there will be renewal of relationship of of people to God and God to people. And so maybe we can take a hint here and pay attention then to how God has been writing this life-giving law of freedom and grace upon our hearts for thousands of years and how that manifests in our lives then, despite our best efforts to keep it stymied and static. For our God is anything but stymied and static. If today we celebrate anything, I think we celebrate the God who has always been moving the God who delivered the people from Egyptian slavery in the ancient, ancient days and then moved with them into the desert wanderings for 40 years. And today is the day that we proclaim that that God was the people's king before they decided that they wanted a human king. But God put up with it anyway and went along with the plan because God listens to us. And today we proclaim the God, the one who went to and fro through the desert and into the monarchy was also the God whom we built into the temple when our kings wanted security. I'm looking at David and Solomon here. But God is the God who was not contained in those temple rocks as they were destroyed by warring nations. And God is the God who, yes, then went into exile with the people and taught them again about deliverance in the midst of hopelessness. And God is the God who, yes, then showed up as Jesus began to teach and preach and lived with those whom society had written off as completely worthless, as God was revealed again as the God who goes with us always, meeting us in our hopeless places, seeking to make right everything we seem to make wrong. And so, maybe Reformation isn't really that new of an idea anyway, as new as a 500-year-old idea could be. And perhaps God is still moving today. Perhaps God is trying to turn us continually, turn us from from things like our Reformation idols of certainty and intellectualism, 
Maybe God is trying to to teach us that this way of Christ really isn't about a a particular cultural heritage or or insider status. Maybe, Maybe God is trying to reach through our love of tradition and liturgy and seasonal colors so that somehow we might know that we are loved by God and accompanied through all seasons of change and development in life. And maybe God can even transform the things that we have used traditionally to divide ourselves, that somehow we might then be reminded of our unity in Christ. And so, dear people, as we remember this Reformation, as we share our confessions of faith like those of our confirmands. And as we embrace these narratives of God's presence and love for us throughout the ages, if nothing else today, today perhaps, we might simply remember the truth that sets us free, that God loves us and accompanies us and all of humanity and makes us one as we live and journey and change. May such truth continue to reform us. Amen.